This is the Homestead Journey Podcast, the podcast dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. This is episode number 17 of the Homestead Journey Podcast, or as we like to say around here, this is step number 17 on our journey towards self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. Welcome everyone. My name is Brian Wells. I am coming to you from 3B Farm and Homestead here in beautiful but frigid upstate New York. Again, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join us on the Homestead Journey. Before we jump into today's show, I do have an editorial correction uh, that I need to offer Um, On last week's episode, on episode number 16, I was consistent, but I was consistently wrong. And that is that I was pronouncing Baker Creek as Baker's Creek. Now, why I did that, I don't know, because I know that it is Baker Creek. But for whatever reason, in my defense, I was very, very consistent. But as I listened back to the episode um, on Monday, uh, after posting, I, I post it and then I always try to listen to it just to make sure that everything came through. Okay. Um, I realized something that I did not realize when I was editing. And that is that I was consistently wrong in pronouncing the name of the Baker Creek seed company. So my apologies on that. My apologies to everyone involved. Uh, but it is Baker Creek, not Baker's Creek. Um, Their website address is rareseeds.com, and uh, so my apologies with regards to that. Now, I am sure that is the first of uh, many uh, apologies and editorial corrections that I'm going to have to make on this podcast, but at least it's taken me until episode number 16 uh, to have to do that. Now, it may be simply that either A, I didn't catch it, B, you didn't catch it, or C, you caught it and you haven't let me know, and there are other editorial corrections that I should have made up to this point, but that is the first one that I have uh, realized, and it's not that big of a deal, but I did mispronounce Baker Creek as Baker's Creek, and so my apologies for that. Anyhow, let's jump right into this week's episode, starting with our homestead happenings. So what's been going on on our homestead this week? Well, here on 3B Farm and Homestead, we actually restarted our kombucha brewing operation. Now, we brewed kombucha, I think it was about three or four years ago for a while. And for whatever reason, I don't really remember why, we got away from doing it. And I didn't really, I, I didn't put the SCOBY in the SCOBY hotel and and um, and keep it well. It actually ended up drying out and going bad on me. And I just never really pursued getting another one. Um, but back the end of last year, my wife, Bonnie, um, had to undergo a round of antibiotics and it really wrecked havoc on her GI system. And so she has been really working to restore that healthy gut biome. And she's been drinking kombucha as a, as a means to, uh, um, I guess, developing that healthy gut bacteria. And uh, so because of that, I, I got to thinking, you know what, it's very expensive to buy kombucha when I can brew kombucha. And so I uh, reached out to a friend of mine who I thought uh, was doing kombucha at home, and she is. And uh, so she was very gracious in giving me a SCOBY. And so we are now uh, in the process of doing our own kombucha. Now, if you're not familiar with what kombucha is, it's a fermented tea. Uh, You can do a a variety of different ways, and you might want to just Google it, it'd probably be easier than me trying to explain all of the different variations of it. We're using black tea, uh, and it, in essence what you do is you uh, create a very strong, sweet black tea, 
And then you have this thing called a SCOBY, which stands for, I think, Symbiotic Colony of Bacteria and Yeast. Don't hold me to it, but I think that's what it means. But really what it is, is it's this kind of this gross looking, rubbery, gooey kind of a thing that you put in that tea. And uh, then it starts a fermentation process. Um, and then you can actually do a second ferment where you add fruits and flavorings and more sugar and you cap it and it creates carbonation and uh, and then that's what well, I mean, you can drink it before then or you can uh, add the carbonation using I never really had much success with the second ferment and so I'm hoping this time around that I'll I'll be a little bit more successful with that but anyhow so we are back in the booch game <laughs> Um, this week also, my son left us for Costa Rica and Panama for nine days. Uh, he left on Thursday, and so that has really provided us with a different perspective on the homestead, kind of giving us a bit of a foretaste of uh, when he goes off to college here. In, a, in fact, this week um, in the mail, we got his first uh, college information pamphlet. And that was like a big old punch in the gut to me. <laughs> I am not ready for this, folks. How did I get this old? Uh, but he got a, uh, a pamphlet from, I believe it was the University of Tampa. And uh, so we will soon, uh, and it's coming quicker than I would like, we'll be um, probably doing the whole college tour thing. So we'll see how all of that goes. But anyhow, so he's in Costa Rica and Panama for the next nine days and so that means that uh, my wife and I are having to uh, pick up the slack of the things that he usually does around here from the standpoint of taking care of the chickens and the geese um, and uh, his guinea pig um, and so that's been going on here on the homestead as well. Finally, this week my seed orders have started to arrive and I have been posting pictures of those to our Instagram page. So um, if you haven't already, jump on over to Instagram and take a look. Um, you'll get an idea of some of the things that we're going to be planting this year. And in an upcoming episode, I will be sharing with you some of the things I'm most excited to be planted. Now, some of these are things that will be new to us, and some of them are things that we've planted before. But in an upcoming episode, I will share all of that with you. But this week, um, our order from Little, what is it? Um, I want to get it right here. LittleShopOfSeeds.com. Uh, that order arrived, as well as my order from Row 7 Seed Company. Um, I am still waiting for my Fedco, my MI Gardener, and my Baker Creek orders. Um, they should be arriving probably this week. But the bulk of my order as usual, went to Fedco, and uh, some things there I'm very excited about trying and, and planting again. Um, again, we've got the things coming from uh, MI Gardener, Baker Creek. There's some new varieties there that I'm really excited about. Uh, Row 7 Seeds, I some of their stuff I just absolutely love. So excited about that. Just so excited about the garden in general. And it won't be long, and we will start up our um, seed starting operation. And uh, But that's still a, a few weeks out. I can't wait. Getting kind of a little bit, of, a little bit cabin crazy. Um, but it is still this week. In fact, last night it got down to, what, negative four? Uh, so one of the colder nights that we've had up to this point this year. Um, in fact, I knew it was coming in, the cold was coming in this week, and so um, I had to make a hay run uh, to get some hay, but our truck broke down last Sunday, and so I wasn't quite sure what to do. I, I was just going to kind of go get four or five bales and shove them into the back of the Subaru and be done with it, and my wife said, you really, you know, you've got the trailer there, why don't you use a trailer? And so... I did go ahead, there were some few things in, in front of it that I had to move out of the way, but uh, I was able to get it out, and uh, so went up and uh, got the hay, put it in there with the pigs, and uh, they did very, very well 
last night. The only thing that really worries me is putting that deep hay in with that sow and the piglets and having the heat lamp there. Um, I keep going in there and pulling the, the hay back just to make sure we don't get any fire started. But uh, they did very well. And uh, so hopefully soon this cold will be over, things will start warming up, and we'll be able to get some seeds in the ground. I know it's coming, but uh, it's very frustrating when I see everybody down in the south uh, starting their seeds and getting things into the ground, and um, we are still literally months away, honestly, from getting the garden fully under way. Anyhow, enough rambling. That's what's been going on on the homestead this week. All right, it is time for this episode's Charting the Course. Now, last week we began our series on chickens, and today in the Homestead Journey Podcast Studios, a.k.a. our office here on the homestead, on 3B Farm and Homestead, I have joining me none other than my beloved son, Brian Wells Jr. How are you doing today, Boo Boo? I'm glad you said that affectionately. All right. I did say it very affectionately, and today we are going to be talking about... Chickens. Chickens. Come on. Now you could act a little bit more enthused than that. Today we are talking about... Chickens. That really wasn't much better. But anyhow, we are going to be talking about chickens today. And in fact, we're going to be talking about the seven breeds of chicken that we are going to have on our homestead this year. So we're going to be revealing that. But before we jump into that, I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the things people might want to think about if they're new to getting chickens. So, Bobo, what are some of the things that people should consider when thinking about getting chickens? Well, I told you not to ask me any questions, but here we go. Um, well, you should be thinking about how many eggs you want, if you want a good egg layer or not. You should be thinking about meat, if you want a dual purpose bird, or if you want a bird just for meat or just for eggs. You also want to think about your climate, just to how hardy a breed is. Okay, so yeah, those are all great things that we would want to be thinking about. We want to think about um, the climate in which we live, because there are certain birds that might do better in a cold climate or certain bed birds that might do better in a warm climate um, and then we want to be thinking about the number of eggs they're going to lay as well as uh, their temperament um, want to think about that as well what about the color of egg um, is that something that people might want to consider um, well if you have a nice variety of colored eggs I mean they're very pretty and they're not only that but they might sell better because people look at them and think oh that's that's different um, not ordinary, and they might be more interested in that than the plain white eggs or brown eggs they might get at the store that are labeled organic. Okay, so let me ask you this, though. Does, a, does the color of an egg affect the flavor or the taste of the egg? Well, no. What then affects the flavor of the egg? Well, it simply comes down to this. The, what the chicken eats definitely affects how the egg tastes and how fresh it is, how long it's been sitting in the warehouse from the, the, the place it came from, the chicken prison, as I like to call it. And if you get it fresh from where chickens are eating grass or bugs or something might, they might naturally eat, the flavor might be more vibrant and crisp than if you got it from the store where they're eating the food out of the conveyor belts that come along the little cages that have all these hormones and all these... I almost said laxatives, but it would be more like um, antibiotics, I think, they put in their in their feed, and the, just the plain corn that they eat would definitely not taste as good as if they had their traditional balanced diet as they would in the wild. Okay, so what a chicken eats is really what is going to contribute more to its um, to, to the flavor of the egg, and probably as well the overall health benefits of the egg. So uh, I think studies have shown that egg uh, chickens that are raised on pasture and so forth are higher in omega-3s, um, which is definitely, they say, is, is better for your heart. Now, take that for what, it, what it's worth, because uh, several years ago they were saying that oatmeal was great for your heart, and now they're saying that maybe it's not so great for your heart, so I don't know. But definitely what a chicken eats is really what's going to affect its flavor, the flavor of its egg, 
not so much the color of its yolk. Definitely. Or not the yolk, but the shell. Yeah, I know what you meant. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, talk a little bit about the temperament of chickens. What are what are some of the things that somebody that's new to chickens might want to think about with regards to the temperament of, of the, the bird? If you're starting out with chickens, you, I'd say you want a bird with a very good temperament, you know, something that won't attack you all the time because that's always an issue. Um, you want one that's, you know, what are you doing? You're moving the mic. Okay. You might want something that's, you know, that isn't really frisky or, I mean, I don't think frisky would be the worst thing. Like, I mean, if they run away from you, I don't really think that's a big issue, but one that might be a little bit more violent or, like, quick to be angered or something like that. You also want to look at, like, how often a chicken might go broody because that's a real pain when the hens get all broody and stuff like that. So you'd want a more mellow hen or definitely a mellow rooster too because you don't want to have issues and it would just be a real pain it might scare you away from having chickens okay yeah, yeah good point and and talk a little bit about what does it mean for a a chicken to go broody well it means that the hen is set it, setting on her eggs obviously and it means that she wants to have her baby chicks so she protects her eggs like they're her chicks and she's waiting for them to hatch and so she's Usually they're pecking and they're, fluff, you know, fluffing up their feathers. Add to that that they're hogging up the nest space. And did I say that right? Nest space. Mm -hmm. <laughs> nest space. And, that, and that, only, that also decreases the amount of egg production, not only from that one hen, but maybe others. They might hide that egg on you too, so <laughs> you never know. Okay. Um, so we've, we've talked about um, a... a having a chicken that is m better adapted to certain climates. So what are some chickens? We live in the Northeast. Um, so what are some breeds that are, are well suited for, for the Northeast? Um, I'd say maybe bigger birds. Mostly dual purpose birds are great for our climate. Um, I mean, I think the Lagrans have fared very well for our climate. I don't know if they're meant for our climate or not. And you do you want to let us know if they're meant for our climate or not? Well, I mean, they've done very well for us up here. I, I don't know as they would necessarily traditionally be seen as, um, I don't know. I'd have to look into that a little yeah, bit more. Yeah. yeah. I know because like the Icelandics, Icelandics aren't necessarily a bird that would necessarily be a heavy bodied bird. They would be a little bit more in the shape of a legern and yet they're very well adapted and suited for a cold climate. Um, but maybe when people are looking at breeds, they might want to look at the name of the breed, right? Definitely. When, when you think about um, some of the, the breeds that are named after U.S. states. So uh, Rhode, a Rhode Island, Island Red, Reds, yeah. New yeah. Hampshire Reds. Yeah. Um, I think New Hampshire was jealous and they just added that on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Delawares uh, is another one that's uh, definitely a cold, hardy breed. So you think about where the breed was developed that's going to give you a good indicator as far as whether or not it's going to be good in, in a colder climate. Um, they name one the Californian. I'm going to stay away from that one because that probably wouldn't be too great. <laughs> oh, no, let's not bang on California too bad because the hatchery that I am going to be interviewing in a couple of weeks is actually located in California. Well, we'll see how that goes. Hopefully they're good-minded people. I'm sure they are. Let's also talk a little bit about the appearance of, of birds. That's something that for you and I, that's something that we do factor in. It's not necessarily make or break, but we definitely like birds that look pretty, right? Yes, we do. So what are some of the things that we look for? Well, obviously we look for feather color. I mean, those with a bigger variety in color, like if you take the well summers, for example, there's a lot of grays and browns. I think there might be some blacks mixed in there, and we find that very pretty. I mean, we have the Delawares, which there's, and the um, silver lace wine dots, mm -hmm. I do believe. Oh, I almost, <laughs> almost forgot their name. They have a lot of black on white and white on black, and it looks very pretty. It's a nice contrast. And then we have our buff Warpingtons. Then we have our, uh, what were they called, Silver Orpingtons, I think they were? No, mm -hmm. they, yeah, uh, Silver. No, the Lavender. Lavender Orpingtons, okay, that's yeah. what they're called. Yeah, and we, it's just we look for a nice variety in our flock, and I think that we would definitely stay ones from like away from ones like Naked Necks because we find those to be hideous, and Guinea Hens, we, look, we say kind of look like rats with beaks, and they sound like rats too, so. <laughs> a little hard on the guinea hens, but the, yeah, the the two th animals right now that my that that your mom has kind of drawn the line in the sand uh, 
guinea with regard to just having them or and what? goats. Guinea hens and goats, yep. No guinea hens and no goats on 3B farm at home. never said anything about sheep, though. We could get sheep. <laughs> Ooh, that's a loophole. <laughs> a little loophole there. I like that. Before we jump into the breeds that we're going to be getting next year, what are some of the breeds that we have tried in the past that we didn't necessarily, didn't necessarily click for us for one reason or another? Let's talk about those. So the first one that comes to my mind is the Rhode Island Reds. Mm -hmm. Very, very popular breed. And uh, we actually didn't try them until last year. Yeah. Was it last yes, year? Yes, definitely. And what were some of the things about the Rhode Island Red that we didn't really care about or care for? At least the, the, the birds that we had. Well, I mean, their their feathers weren't exactly the most pretty ones, obviously. They're just one tone. But I found them to be quite mean birds to the others in our flocks. And we often had very beat-up birds due to the Rhode Island Reds. Especially we had the uh, Easter Acres, which definitely got beat up by them. I mean, even our Buff Warpingtons kind of got pecked by those. But um, I think that's just the main reason why. They, they find them to be very mean yeah, they, they were a little bit. Chickens. Yeah, definitely. We found the Rhode Island Reds, and I know they're very popular with a lot of people. We just found them to be rather aggressive birds, both towards us and towards the other birds uh, in our flock. Well, I and, didn't really have any aggression. They didn't really have any aggression towards me, but I definitely saw it towards the rest of the flock. I think they would work better if you had just a flock of Rhode Island Reds instead of a mix. I think they might work better that way. And if we did try it like that, I think it would have worked out better. But obviously, we're so attached to our other breeds that we might as well just keep it mixed. Yeah, and we like we like the variety of having. Now, several years ago, we did go to a single variety, which was the Buff Orpington. Um, actually, for a couple of seasons, we were straight Buff Orpington. That, that here. went very well. I like um, them. <laughs> and we and we love them. We're going to talk about them here a little bit uh, a little bit later, but. Um, the uh, the Rhode Island Reds were ones that well, we 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 didn't necessarily enjoy. What are some other ones that we have tried and just decided not to to keep? Well, we had the Laver lavender Orpingtons, excuse me again, and we're not a big fan of them. I think that I think I don't know what we really disliked about them. They're kind of boring birds. I don't. They're kind of like the Buff Orpingtons, except they're just their colors different. So I would say with the Lavender Orpingtons, you're right. They do look very similar to the Buff Orpingtons. I don't know as they hit necessarily, at least the ones we have, don't necessarily seem, seem to have the same disposition, though. Yeah, definitely. I, I don't know. There's just something about them. They're okay, but they're just not. not the best. Yeah. They, they, we tried them. They're, they're pretty birds. About. And, and it could be the strain that we got, um, but uh, they definitely just didn't wow us. Um, their eggs were pretty. I yeah, like their eggs. But uh, just the, the birds themselves, uh, we could just kind of take them or leave them. Um, there's a few other ones that we've tried. What about the uh, salmon favorols? you remember having those? We tried those uh, several years in a row. I'm trying to remember their color. Were they the black ones? No. With the white? Um, no, they were. Uh, the salmon favorols are um, a little bit more of like I think a reddish color. But we never really got to see them. And that's a big part of the reason why we've stopped getting them is that for whatever reason, they just seem to be a not as hardy of a breed. Mm -hmm. And so we would order five chicks and maybe one would survive. Um, there oh, was just something. Those. Yeah, those. Yeah, you that know, was remember, not. They just never, they, they just weren't a hardy like breed. It, it seemed like whether it was in the mixed flock that they just weren't able to compete with the other ones or, or what. I don't know. Um, maybe it was the same problem that we had with the Easter Ages where they couldn't compete. And they were frisky, I don't know. Probably yeah. the cold, too. They couldn't keep up with that. The, the Easter Eggers are another ones that we love having in our flock from the standpoint of them the, the having the color of their eggs oh, in yeah. our... I love their puffy cheeks. They, they, they I just love them. They, their appearance is beautiful. We have, we've had them, the ones that didn't get beat up or died, were absolutely gorgeous birds. I love them so much, but they just... They got pecked down by the flock and all that stuff, and it was just... I think if that's, that's another breed, kind of like the... Um, Rhode Island Reds, if, if they had their own flock, they would have done much better than if they were with our mixed group. Yeah, and that's one of the things that we've at least found here on, on our farm is that there are certain breeds that um, they might do better with, they're just a little bit more meek and mild in temperament. Or and, they might be over and on temperament, temperament yeah, towards and, the other birds in the flock and all that stuff. Exactly. And so that's one of the things that, again, from a temperament perspective, you need to think about. Um, and, you know, if you're going to have multiple 
breeds within your flock, you need to think about integrating those breeds. And there are some breeds that we found, at least in our flock, the Easter Eggers being one, the Salmon Favarols being another, um, and uh, the Rhode Island Reds being another, that we didn't feel like they integrated well. Either they were too aggressive or not aggressive enough with other breeds definitely definitely and that's just been that's been our experience um you may have had a different experience and if you have i would definitely love to hear from you you can contact me at the homestead journey podcast at gmail.com or contact us via our social media sites on instagram and facebook the links are in the description below so without further ado let us give the people what they've been waiting for they have been tuned in and waiting with bated breath to hear the seven breeds that we're going to have here on 3B Farm and Homestead this year. So we're going to actually start with the three breeds that are ones that we we keep we keep ha- a- having them every year. They're they're kind of our go-to yeah. favorites, and two of them are ones that we have had for many years now. And we had a new bird enter in, a new breed enter into that category this year. Definitely. So let's start with the two that have been constant mainstays in our flock now for many years. The first being my favorite, Mm -hmm. the Buff Orpington. Definitely. Absolutely love the Buff Orpington. To me, when the sunlight hits a Buff Orpington just right, there is no more beautiful breed. It just almost glows, right? Yeah, they are. And they're very, very mellow. And I always have a good time with them. And they're... They're always great. I mean, I've had some that, you know, they're, they're not afraid of me. They'll literally just hang around the end of my booster. They'll start pecking at my feet with the snow on it. They're just great birds. I love them to death. I I like to see them every year. They're great. And even the roosters, most of the time, are very calm and subtle. I like them a lot. Yeah, so they're they're a great, great bird. Um, and they're, they're a good egg layer. They, they lay a brown egg, but they're a, 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 a great egg layer. One of the downsides to the buff, I wouldn't call it a downside. It just depends on what you're trying to do with them. But the buff Orpingtons do have a tendency to want to go broody. Oh, definitely, definitely. And that's their only downside to the breed. It's just, and then they sit for weeks and weeks. And usually it isn't all of them. Usually it's about one or two hens that have that issue. And so that's that's why we stay with them because they don't all go broody. So it's it's a very, that's the only downside. But we've also used that, and I would hate to call it a downside, but we've also used that to our advantage because that's how several years ago when we went breed specific, it was the Buff Orpington. And what we did was we used those broody hens to hatch out our chicks. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, definitely the Buff Orpingtons is a great, great temperament, great egg layer, a dual purpose bird. Um, we really, really love them. The second, um, I guess, go-to bird for us is your favorite. Oh, definitely. Yeah. And that is the? The Lagerns. Oh, I love them so much. They remind me of my great-grandfather, Malcolm L. Wells, the man who I kind of grew up under. He really got me into chickens when I was young. And so these birds, they were I don't know if these were his favorite, but I these were the first birds I remember him having. And so they will always have a special place in my heart because they take me back to the days when he was the one who took care of the flock. So it's just very, very special. And they're great egg layers too. And this year, I mean, usually they're very, very hot-tempered. They'll run away. They're always frisky, and they're always running about, flapping their feathers. But this year, I've noticed that they've kind of been a little bit more tame towards me it's just really weird they're just not like the rest we've ever had so i don't know what's going and, on and when, you, and when you say hot tempered you're not necessarily saying aggressive towards you're saying they're skittish yes yeah, right? skittish that'd probably, probably be a better word yeah they're definitely a, a more flighty bird um they they can fly better because of, oh yeah uh just because of the the construction or i guess of their body yeah they get out all the time yeah and so that's that's one of the downsides to them is that um, we do keep our our chickens in a, in a run, and that's for a number of reasons. Um, but part of that is predator uh, issues, and um, we have lost a couple of leggerns to predators because they've gotten outside of the run, and whether it was a hawk or whatever, I uh, have gotten them. So um, if you need to keep a breed contained because maybe you live in a suburban area um, or you live in an urban area, 
and uh, you can't have your chickens running around on you, a legern's probably not going to be a good option for yeah. you. Even if you try to twi trim its wings, which we have done, um, that's definitely not good. probably going to be a, a good choice of a breed for you. Yeah. Um, but they are prolific egg layers. Um, they, they lay and lay and lay and lay. In fact, from my understanding, the vast majority of commercial egg laying flocks uh, either are legerns or they can trace their, their, yeah. their, their genetics back to to the legern. Now, if you want a dual purpose breed, Legerns, uh, legerns not, not your for you. no. They're they're definitely not as much meat on the bones. Although we will dress them off and can them up. There's not not anything wrong with that. But they certainly aren't going to be a heavy body mm -hmm. bird. With they a make lot good of meat. broth too. So yeah. I mean, you can still use their bones and all that stuff. It's pretty good. Yep. All right. And the third uh, in our go to, it's kind of the new one to our uh, to this list, is the. The Delawares. Yeah, the Delaware. We got those for the first time last year, and we absolutely love these birds. What absolutely about them? fabulous. Well, they're kind of, they have, I'd say, maybe even a better temperament than the Buff Orpingtons. They're very mellow. They're great egg layers, and honestly, I love their their um, their feather color. And it's, they're absolutely great birds. They're great for mixing with the flock. They went great, especially with their Buff Orpingtons, and they're very good variety of a flock you know they're very good for integration i really like them they worked very well this year yeah and they're they're a, another heavy dual you know heavy body dual purpose bird um and uh, we just really really have been very happy with them from a temperament perspective just the way they look in a mixed oh, flock yeah. um and uh, they're they're good egg layers as well so those are our three go-to birds right now the buff orpingtons the legrins and the delawares so now on to the breeds that are going to be new to us this year. Well, I shouldn't say new. Uh, in this list, there is one breed that's returning to our flock that mm -hmm. we had several years ago. And there's another one that is, well, it's kind of a breed that we had this year. It's just a different different take type, Yeah, different that. take. So let's talk about those next. So the first one, uh, this is one that's returning to our flock, and that is the... The Black Sex Link. Oh, boy. Okay. So... A couple years ago, it might have been last year or the year before, we went, a couple of our birds, or chicks, died, and we went over to Tractor Supply, and we picked up a couple birds, and we had no clue what they were. They just kind of threw some in it. Well, I can't say threw because it sounds so violent. They put some in a carton. We took them home. They kind of just grew up. And I had no idea what these were until I was looking through the pamphlet, either last year or this year. And... They are absolutely gorgeous birds. They kind of have like this green tint to the to the black feathers, and they have this this beautiful these beautiful red feathers near the top of their head, and their temperament is also amazing. Again, like the Buff Orpingtons and Delawares, absolutely mellow birds. I remember them being very good egg layers. I saw them on the nest every day, and I'm very happy to see these return. All right, yeah, yeah. So they're uh, definitely a very pretty bird. Um, when the sunlight hits them just right, like Brian said, there's a bit of a greenish tint to them. Uh, they had a, a good temperament, and uh, so we're very excited to give them a try again. Now, the, the breed that we're getting that's kind of a take on the breed that we had this year is the... The Golden Laced Wine Dot, which is kind of a play on the Silver Laced Wine Dot. It's just... Again, we're very we're very happy with you. You want to continue? <laughs> I cut you off there. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. Um, the th one of the things that we actually really like about the uh, golden lace wine dot, well, the the, the silver lace wine dot versus the golden lace wine dot, is the, is um, the color of their feathers. Is the color right? of the feathers. So, th the reason why we wanted to try the golden lace wine dot is because we do have a lot of black and white in our flock. When you look at the uh, the Delawares and the black sex links. And a couple of the other ones that we're going to be talking about. And so we wanted to have a little bit of a different color variation in the flock. And so that's why we thought, okay, let's give the Golden Lace Wine Dots a try. Now, one of the things we're not sure about is whether or not their personalities are going to be the same or similar to the Silver Lace Wine Dots. I assume they would be. I think they will be as well, but yet when we look at the Lavender Orpingtons that we had this year versus the Buff Orpingtons, we didn't quite like them as well. Now, it could just be the birds that we got. It could be just the strain that we got. We're going to have to find out and I didn't see. really find much of a difference in temp temperament between the two. You I didn't? Just, no, no, not really. Oh. Yeah, I just found the, the, the what were they called? The, the coloring? The, the Lavender Orpingtons to be quite boring and dull. I mean, they weren't just... 
You just don't, don't think they're as pretty. I, just, I don't think they're as pretty. Yeah, I just don't think they have quite the personality. But that's just me. Me, yeah, um, I go with personality. You definitely inter- you interact with them a little bit more than I do. Now, one of the other reasons why we are looking at the golden uh, laced wine dots is because we w- we always like to have a rooster every year. Oh yeah. And this year we were actually planning on having a what was it? It was a uh, was it going to be a Delaware rooster, and yep. that died. And we but oh, we yeah. ended up with. Uh, Silver Lace Wine Dot Rooster, kind of on accident, they sexed it wrong. And we've actually been very, very happy with that rooster for a couple of reasons. What are the two reasons that we really like that rooster? Well, A, he has a peak home, and he has, I mean, it keeps him from having frostbite, and that will be good. We might try to enter him in the fair next year, which will be fun. B, his feathers are absolutely gorgeous. Although he's missing his tail feathers right now, and he's probably going to grow them back, hopefully, when molting comes around. And he has quite the personality. I absolutely love him. His name is Emphysema Guy because he has this little wheeze after he crows, and it's just absolutely adorable. And he has a great temperament because for a couple of years now, I've been having an issue with roosters. Between I don't know what I don't know what was causing it, or if I was just not having a great time with roosters. I don't know what was causing it, but we had I think it was. One by Fortington, and what was the other one that was really mean? The Barbed Rock. The Barbed Rock was, I don't know what was going on. They started out nice, and then they just became extremely violent. I have no idea what I did. I don't know if it was I, just... I don't really think you did anything wrong. I just think it was those roosters. Sometimes roosters will be very, very nice, and then they'll just become very aggressive. And in part, I think what they're trying to do is they're trying to protect their flock. They're trying to protect their hens. They show off. But on the other hand, we also need, they need to understand that we're the boss. Um, and it seemed like neither one of those uh, ever those roosters figured ever out. figured that out. Yeah. Where E.G. has been up to this point, been just great Absolute personality, sweetheart, and and that's and he is right. We we um we nicknamed him Emph- well E.G. for short Emphysema guy. I was and how we came about that name is I was telling a friend of mine at work that uh, he had this really weird wheeze after he crowed, and he said, <laughs> "What is he an emphysema guy?" And I just thought it was hysterical. I came over and told Brian J about it. And uh, so it became EG for short. So, uh, yeah. But the other thing, going back to the peak home, that's the other thing that we really, really like about uh, having a, a rooster of this breed is that they do have a peak home. And the difference between a peak home and a single comb is that the peak homes don't stand up as high, so they're not as prone to frostbite. Yeah, they're kind of... If you've ever seen the cushion comb, it's kind of like that, but a little bit different. They kind of have like the two little strands going back, and it's it's pretty neat. I like them. I like it. it's a different look. Yeah, definitely, and and definitely, we we enter our our chickens in the fair every year, um, and uh, we'll, we've always struggled with the uh, the cockerels always do well, the young ones, but then they go through that winter with that single comb, and especially on the buff warping hens and the uh, the. Um, Barred rocks. It's such a large comb that eventually it just gets frostbit, and uh, which is a real shame because they're pretty too. So I mean, it's just sad. And, and there are things that we probably could do, but you know, they they say if you put um, Vaseline on them, it's supposed to ward off frostbite. I don't but think we I just do that too. We we just have never really be, because again, for us, it's not necessarily all about the show either. So we'll see if this. Um, it, it seems like he's really surviving the winter well. And uh, not getting the frostbite like the other ones did. And so hopefully with um, getting a, a, a golden laced wine dot male, um, we'll have the same success. Maybe we could get Grandma to knit, knit, knit our rooster a little sweater for his comb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay, so the next breed that we are um, going to talk about, this is one that you've discovered and that you're very excited about. And that is oh, the... Oh yeah, the speckled Sussex. What about it? Besides the name, Speckled Sussex. Speckled that's Sussex. so fun to say. <laughs> Speckled Sussex. Um, well, besides the name, what is it about that bird that you are excited about? All right. So I saw this one at the fair last year, Washington County Fair, and they are absolutely gorgeous birds. And they seem like they have a good temperament, too. So if you don't know what they look like, you can go ahead and look it up. I highly recommend you look up, look them up and see their feathers. But it's almost con- kind of like the chicken's brown and then someone took paint of different colors and started splattering it with it. I don't know. They look just just looks like 
drops of paint on it. I don't know how else to describe it. But I think it's so adorable, so cute. And I, it, it just seems like they have a good temper too. So I really hope this breed works out and I'm very excited to try this. So, so just to kind of give you, and again, I would recommend um, that you go uh, look these up. In fact, I'll try to put a link to a picture of each one of these breeds in the show notes. But the speckled Sussex, the way they're described in the um, in the uh, what do we call this? We Hoover's call Hatchery it, yeah. the uh, official catalog, 2020 catalog reference guide from Hoover's Hatchery. They describe it like this. The oldest and most common coloring is a speckled breed that has dark brown or mahogany colored feathers and some black and blue feathers with white ends, making the speckles show throughout their plumage. The speckles can become more prominent as the bird molts each year. So That doesn't sound sophisticated. I don't know what does. <laughs> Absolutely. And they're a good, it seems like they're a good egg layer. Uh, this has an average of 240 a medium cream colored eggs every year. And so we're, we're excited to try them out. The speckled Sussex, if for no other reason than because it is so fun to say. <laughs> All right. The next breed that we're going to try is another one. And I am not really quite sure. How do you even say that breed? Lakenvielder. Lakenvielder? No, Lakenvielden. Lake is that an R or an N? Your hand, uh, your handwriting is confusing me. Well, Lakenvielden. I, That's a, I, I think, think it's, it's an R. A, yeah. Laken, let me look it up Lake, here. I think it's Lakenvielden because it's a. I think it's of German descent. The way that this is. Ends in an R. Laken, so, Lakenvelder is an old German breed. I knew it. I knew it was German. I could tell. I could just tell. See, I told you so. And you, can, you can keep talking about it. Okay. So what about the. Lakenvelder, or Lakenvelder, Lakenvelder. Lakenvelder sounds more. What sounds about more it that uh, we we uh, w w what was it that drew us to this breed? Well, first of all, the look of them, and secondly, the name. The name se seems interesting enough. And let me just read the, the the description here. The necks, the neck, saddle, and tail feathers of the Lakenvelder are black, while wings, black, and breast are white. The pattern gives them a belted look similar to a Dutch belted cattle in Hampshire, ho Hampshire hogs. Well, okay, we're going to stop there because that's bizarre. But they're absolutely, don't laugh at me, stop sassing me. Okay, keep they're going. absolutely gorgeous looking birds and they remind me a little bit. I just think that they have a different pattern of black and white to them and since we're getting rid of the silver lace wine dots for the golden lace wine dots, I think it would keep that black and white color looking very nice. And honestly, I think the size of the hens would mix very well with our Orpingtons and our Delawares and the spe speckled Sussex and all that stuff. And so I'm, I also think it's a very, excuse me, a very good egg layer, it seems to be. And so I'm very excited. I think my father is excited. I think he's more excited to pronounce the name again. So I'm just going to leave it to him. We're going to keep going. The Lakenvelder. Um, they are uh, a lighter breed, um, at least according to the description here. So we'll see how, how well they do. Definitely don't seem to be a, like a, a dual purpose breed. Um, but they definitely look to be a very, very uh, pretty chicken and um, a, a, good, a good egg layer. 280 medium uh, white eggs every year. So my guess is they're probably going to look kind of like a um, a, a, a legern, but just with black and white on it. Oh, That's my exciting. guess. I so, hope they have good temperament. Does it say no. they have good temperament? It I says they're active, so they might be a little flighty. Ooh, all right. But we'll, we'll see. I'm, we'll I'm see looking forward to seeing. Um, now, the last one that we are going to be getting this year is, is another, called... Another tongue twister, ladies and gentlemen. Stick with us. What is it? The Parthage... I don't know how you... Sp <laughs> you can't. <laughs> I can't read... Can you read this for me? Because this... Okay, ladies and gentlemen, here we are right now. He mixed the B, the R, and the G together, it looks like. I don't know what I'm looking at. It looks to be of a foreign, unknown language yet to be deciphered. Don't laugh uh, at me. <laughs> we are keeping this in here, too. I hope you know that. It is. I can't even say this. It's one. Partridge something rock. The Partridge Plymouth rock. 
That's Plymouth? Yes, the Partridge Plymouth Rock. <laughs> Wait, but it's not that bad. This is horrible. <laughs> this is absolutely horrible. It looks like a B, an L, a G, R, O, O, T, H, Rock. I don't know what that is. <laughs> you, can, you can continue going. It's the Partridge Plymouth Rock is, is what it is. And um, it's... A relative, I, I guess, of the Plymouth Rock, the bar, or what a lot of people know as the Bard Rock, but it's a, a different coloring, and um, and so I'm excited to try it out. It's a brown bird, and Get the wrong picture. that's right there. <laughs> I was looking at the one. Yeah, above. You, that's the Bard Plymouth Rock. <laughs> like, what um, are you talking but about? But this is this is the uh, the Plymouth Rock, uh, pl- Partridge Plymouth Rock. It's a brown, um, a brown bird. And, uh, the, again, the description of this, it's uh, stunningly regal. Um, and uh, with a New England heritage, they don't let January's blizzards interrupt Lane. So that's another reason that we were kind of drawn to this bird is the climate issue. Uh, and we'll see how well they do during the winters and whether or not they continue to lay well. So, you mind if I add something to that? What? Well, they also kind of look like well summers, which we're kind of having an issue with. They're getting beat up, even though they're extremely pretty birds and they look great as cockerels. Not cockerels, as... Pullets. Pullets, that's the word we're going for. Okay. Every time I get a word wrong, you take a shot and you'll be drunker than you'll be <laughs> blind by the time we're done with this. <laughs> so as pullets, they're absolutely gorgeous. I love them to pieces. They're beautiful. They're not too flighty. They're a little bit flighty, though. But we have an issue where they age that time and the weathering and the mix with the other birds in the flock really starts to take a toll with them. Their combs get chapped, their feathers, like the tail feathers are the first thing to go. It's, it's just, it really, they really deteriorate, deteriorate, there's another shot, very quickly. So that's what you that, got? That's what I got. You're okay. up. You're up. All right. So, folks, I hope that you've enjoyed this. Um, these are the seven breeds that we're getting this year on our homestead. The Buff Orpingtons. The Delawares. Leggerns. Spe- speckled Sussex. Black Sex Links. Golden Laced Wine Dots. Both male and female. The Lackenvelders. And the Partridge Plymouth, uh, Plymouth Rock. Rock. That does not look like Plymouth. That looks like something else. <laughs> so the Partridge Bliganuth. Plymouth Rock. Folks, Thank you so much. Um, this has been a joy, Brian, having you on here to talk chickens. I really enjoy uh, talking chickens with you. And really, quite frankly, folks, one of the highlights of my year is uh, sitting down with Brian and talking about the different breeds of bird that we're going to get on our homestead. Um, every year, I just really, really enjoy that. I, I love watching you interact with the flock and uh, the fact that you enjoy the chicken so much on our homestead. And so thank you for being on the uh, Homestead Journey podcast. Well, thank you for having me because now I've procrastinated on my homework just a little bit more. (laughs) I look forward to this every year because I get to do a little bit less of my homework. All right. Have a good evening. Well, folks, hopefully you enjoyed that as much as I enjoyed uh, Talking Chickens with Brian J. Uh, Thanks once again for joining us on the Homestead Journey. If you haven't already, please give us a like and a thumbs up on your favorite Uh, podcast platform, leave us a review. And if you could also share this podcast with other people that you think might benefit from it or enjoy uh, our conversations with regards to homesteading. As always, the music on this episode is provided by audionautics.com. And folks, until next time, keep up the good work.